So first of all, I'm a native Texan. I'm from San Antonio. Um, we started hearing more and more in the news about young men dying at the hands of the police. And this was around the time that uh, somebody in my immediate family was sentenced to 20 years in the prison. And so a lot of what I do is think about, as a curator, is think about what's happening in the world, how that may be something that might also be happening in my own life. And I look to artists to think about how they're dealing with the same problems as a way to try to understand both of these things. So those events of of looking at, and certainly in the past five years, we've thought more and more about the questions and problems of mass incarceration as they're being brought to the limelight through problems like social media. Um, so that began the way for me to, first of all, start having conversations with artists. And as I began to talk to the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston about what an exhibition that would become walls turned sideways that would look like, for me, the question of how to make this exhibition began by saying, what does it mean to bring a conversation about justice into the museum? And for me, that answer began, to, began by thinking about how the museum has historically maybe enacted in its own injustices, and to think about how the museum and the prison are sisters, are like all institutions, these sort of government structures by which we serve or govern our communities. So with that premise in mind, I'll start there for you to think about this kind of larger works in the center of this exhibition space here. And then, um, then we'll go around the perimeter of the space, which I've organized according to themes. So to start off, we have this chart here by an artist named Andrea Fraser, whose work is primarily takes the form of institutional critiques. She's often thinking about how the museum is a part of a larger political and ideological structure. And this is a series of two graphs um, where she's kind of consolidating all of her research on this topic. And what she noticed was that as the rich get richer, they, they buy more art. And that because they have more art, more art is donated to museums. As the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, and thus there's more poverty-related crimes, and thus more prisons are built. So the relationships of building of prisons has mirrored the building of museums over the past um, 30 years according to like um, income disparity. Um, so I really hope that y'all have a chance to think and look more closely at this work here. And then I'll also turn your attention behind you to Mary Patton, who I think is a really important artist in the exhibition. And also this piece, I think, is really important for setting up a lot of the terms that you're going to see as we move through. But Mary Patton is an artist based in Chicago. And she found this um, transcription for a panel that happened in 1974. It was a really important panel. It was the first moment that sort of French philosophy, and I'm thinking about people like Michel Foucault or Gilles Deleuze, were introduced to American audiences. And this was the year that also Foucault's um, really important text, Discipline and Punished, was published in the United States in English. So this is the recreation of that panel that happened in New York in 1974. Um, and so you have Michel Foucault, who's the, being played by this actor on the right, um, speaking right now, along with Judy Clark, who is a prison rights activist. Howie Harp, at the time, was only 22 years old, but had spent the majority of his teenage years institutionalized in an asylum, and when he was old enough to get his freedom from those asylums, became an anti-asylum activist. And lastly, um, Ronald Lang, who's a radical, uh, anti-psychiatrist in the 70s. And so all of them are talking about this relationship between the prison and the asylum as oppressive structures. And if you sit down and listen to it, even though it's 1974, I think a lot of the things that they're talking about are still really pertinent today. So it's not only the relationship between the prison and the museum, but here the asylum, and how all of these institutions are born of the same structural logic. And that's the place that I wanted to start on. Um, what I then realized when I was talking to artists who were working across the country was because this questions of the criminal justice system, mass incarceration, and the prison industrial complex are so complex that artists are only able to sort of tackle one aspect of that problem at a time, which made 
um, which helped me kind of organize the exhibition into these themes. And what I realized was that I could organize a path for you all um, that kind of sets up a loose chronology from the moment one is profiled to the moment of arrest, then onward to uh, due process, the court as kind of the site for which um, decisions of guilt or innocence get played out, to incarceration, which is the largest section of the exhibition, and then finally, one of three ways that you can exit the prison. So we'll get to there at the end, so let's start uh, profiling. I'm gonna talk about two artists here. Um, behind you on this wall is Suzanne Lacey, who in the late 1980s, early 1990s, began working with youth in Oakland. She was then based in Oakland, and this was a moment, if you can remember, that um, there was a lot of media portrayal about like delinquent youth, and she was finding that the teenagers that she was working with were internalizing these messages that they were hearing of themselves on the media and then believing themselves to be criminal than perhaps acting out criminally. And there was a lot of antagonism between um, the police and, youth, and Oakland youth at this particular moment. So Suzanne Lacey, along with a number of artists based in the Bay Area, but then really importantly, the teens themselves began what is called the Oakland Projects, which is a series of projects that took place over 10 years. On the back of this wall, you have um, a rep small representation of the Oakland Projects. Um, in which Suzanne Lacey staged these interactions between teens and cops so that they could directly talk to each other about their public, like how they were misperceiving each other. And I think Suzanne Lacey is a really important starting point for this exhibition, and then her work certainly um, provides a foreground for somebody like Dred Scott, who 10 years later in 2008, this is New York City in the middle of stop and frisk, also was really interested in how teens were being profiled by the police and often stopped for stopped and arrested for crimes that weren't crimes. So what he did was he wanted to work with the teens directly um, and start from that point as the basis. And what he found out was um, they were really afraid and um, were often afraid to go outside and play like couldn't actually be teens or kids anymore. And what they did together was decide that um, through conversations with Dredd, they decided that what they wanted to do was to show the process by which they were criminalized by creating a series of wanted posters. So Dredd arranged for their five teens to have passing encounters with adults. And then afterwards, those adults sat down with a police sketch artist. This process of um, trying to remember what those teens look like was then put on as a public performance so that the audience could see that it's often this sort of really ambiguous guesswork of trying to assemble a criminal profile. So what resulted was these very sort of generic pictures of these teens paired with texts that they had um, of what they had experienced in the world. So often cops would stop them saying like, you look like you're looking out for a crime. You look like you have um, a criminal lifestyle choice or, or making furtive movements. These are not reasons to stop anybody on the street. And what then they did was post these um, posters all over Harlem in businesses, which then led the teens to have, be able to have conversations with local business members, and then for those business members to become advocates for the teams to their customers and really shift the way that they were being perceived in the streets. So this section also includes two works, um, one by Rodrigo Valenzuela, and then a series of exit signs that were made by an artist named Jenny Pollock. And each of the exit signs is the floor plan of a particular museum. In fact, the green one was designed, it's for the CAM, and it's an exit sign that helps you get out of the building without going through the front door in case of an immigration raid. Um, there's also an exit sign here by the building because with immigration being such an important topic right now, um, we also wanted to think about the way that immigrants were targeted as criminal as well. Um, I'm gonna stay here and then y'all can follow me out um, because this is quite a small room and I wanted to um, to kind of create a more solemn and private space to think about the way that artists are dealing with the question of arrest 
because what they're what this group of artists in particular are talking about is, is extrajudicial killing. Um, so what you'll see on the largest of the back projection is a project by an artist named Sean Leonardo. It's called The Eulogy, and it was actually commissioned as part of um, the Contemporary Art Museum's Radical Presence exhibition when it traveled to San Francisco, so it's great to have it back here. Sean Leonardo took text from the novel The Invisible Man, and for those of you who are not familiar with that text, there is a really incredibly heart-wrenching passage in which the narrator's dear friend dies at the hands of the police. And he delivers this eulogy where he keep, keeps repeating the name Brother Todd Clifton as a way to like really drill that name into the memory of the public, knowing that it will be quickly forgotten as the next political event arises. In this case, Leonardo has replaced the name Todd Clifton with one of 17 young men that we've heard in the news, beginning with Trayvon Martin. Um, opposite Sean Leonardo's video is an installation by an artist named Carl Pope, who's based in Indianapolis. And this installation, he had the idea for this installation when a young man was killed in Indianapolis in 1991 and instead of being charged, the police officer got a trophy um, and got promoted. So looking back over the history of killings in Indianapolis, he realized this pattern of citizen being killed and then the police officer being accommodated. So there's a trophy for each of the 30 men killed in a 10-year period at the hands of the police, and it functions as a sort of reverse memorial. So on one hand, acknowledging this death, but then also acknowledging this practice of accolades. We paired that with Chris Burden's response to the 1990s riot, which is this oversized police cost, uh, uniform. And then opposite that, another work by Sean Leonardo in which um, he went looking for images of the Rodney King event and found that most of the images online have all been cropped to focus on Rodney King's body huddled over and by two police officers. But the original image, the uncropped version, shows 11 cops that are witness to the scene. Um, so what Sean has done in the image is kind of widened out Rodney King's body so that it becomes the background to this other larger scene that we don't often talk about. So I'll give you all a little moment to walk through and spend some time there, and I'll meet you on the other side. So the arrest section really became a place to think about memorialization and how artists are using the form of the memorial to think about moments when arrest leads to death. Should you move on to the next stage of the criminal justice system, you will find yourself in the courtroom. And this is a ser one of a series of photog photographs by a collaborative um, Max Becker and Andrea Robbins. And they became interested in this phenomenon that happened in the 1950s when the movie, The Ten Commandments, came out. Uh, a number, like a fraternal order, like a men's club, um, would often show screenings of the Ten Commandments as a way to raise money to make Ten Commandments monuments to position in front of courthouses, mostly in conservative states. So for instance, next time you go to the Capitol in Texas, in Austin, there's actually a Ten Commandments monument on the side. So what they did was travel to all 50 states and all the courtyards that they knew of that had a Ten Commandments themed monument in the front. The most famous of these monuments was actually built by Judge Roy Moore in Alabama. It was 5,000 pounds. And he briefly was disbarred for not taking it down from the Alabama courthouse. And I think that like his sentiments most directly speak to the sort of logic behind this. He speaks about um, the, Bible, the biblical law being the foundation for the US Constitution, how those two things should not be disentangled. And yet, we publicly think about the separation of church and state. So I think the, the sort of core at Becker and Robbins project is like, how true is that statement? 
Um, behind me is also a set of two works by a Houston artist that y'all may know, Jamal Cyrus. Um, in addition to thinking about the actual courthouse, I wanted to think about the court of public opinion and how important, how our mediated representations of who is a criminal also help determine how they are treated in the court system. So each of these is um, a replication of a newspaper page that's in the archive. Jamal has taken a laser cutter to excise all of the words and they present two different perspectives on the case of Lee Otis Johnson. Um, I'm going to turn this way because we're now going to enter into the incarceration section of the exhibition. And the theme that became apparent in this section had to do, on one hand, with time, how you measure time, um, and the sort of and the sort of like account of dailiness while incarcerated, but also how incarceration affects families. So, for instance, this is a photograph by or a project by Dina Lawson on the back, and it's actually a, a found archive of her cousin's personal photographs that she's reproduced. And as you go through, you'll notice that the woman's hairstyle change the baby gets older, but the man is relatively always in the same outfit, maybe his shirt color changes, but they're always standing in front of the same wall. So what Dina Lawson is showing us is this phenomenon by which um, your interaction with an incarcerated family member happens within this very confined time of the visiting hour, and how that is spatialized as to always have the same sort of physical presence. So the way that time is counted is by the accumulation of these images and also by the aging of the family, but the relative staticness of the man. Um, Sable Smith here and Titus Kafar um, are both artists with incarcerated fathers. Titus became, began what is called the Jerome Project when he was looking for his father's mugshot on an online database. And what he found was the um, 99 other men who shared his father's name, Jerome. And so for him, that spoke to um, racial disparities within the criminal justice system itself. So he began using this online archive of photographs as the basis of a series of portraits. In this case, we have multiple images of different Jeromes overlaid on top of each other. And Sable Elise Smith's video here, called Men Who Swallow Themselves in Mirrors, um, is also a way for her to think about um, her relationship with her father who is incarcerated um, within the time of the institution because that certainly mediates like how they get to respond, whether that's um, during visiting hours, whether that's um, on phone calls that have a certain amount of time that you can actually interact. And then of course that's mediated by like where you are in the country and time zones, et cetera. Um, and, but also thinking about the time of the video and of image-based media. So Sable has interwoven um, different interviews with her father with mediated images from Hollywood films in which black men are rem like rendered criminal. Cheryl Rowland is here. I saw him earlier. Um, and this is, here he is. And this is his project behind me. This is a project called, Cheryl, do you want to talk about it? OK. <laughs> This is a project called After the Wake Up, I'm sorry, The Wake Up, and is, no, I'm nervous because you're right there, um, is a project that Cheryl came up with after having an experience of being incarcerated in Washington, D.C., and while there, it was his job to make the cells ready um, for the next prisoner and to kind of turn them over when they changed occupancy. So as part of that, he would paint a coat of paint, often on top of marks carved in the wall, which I think of as these like kind of personal gestures to make a space your own in the time that you're there. And once he painted over them, the marks never went away. So this really great thing that Cheryl has done is he's offering all of us a prompt to think about and then use the tools that are very much like the kinds that you would see in prison to carve into the walls. And a on a regularly scheduled cycle, a new question will be asked, 
and the wall will be painted over. And you'll have the reminder of the previous marks that you're carving on top of. Um, and I think as the questions progress, they get more and deeper into the sort of philosophical and ideological questions that have to do with confinement, how we perceive innocence or guilt, and who gets to have those qualities. So let's keep going. So we're going to take a little moment for a color, a color breather here um, between uh, Trevor Paglin and Kapuani Kawanga. Trevor Paglin is a photographer who's really well known for doing work on surveillance. And this beautiful, what appears to be like an abstract, um, abstract landscape, perhaps sunset, as you will see like on the bottom, those bright like glowing orbs don't really quite add up to like the sun of even glow of a sunset. Instead, they become like four differentiated sort of orbs. And this is actually a portrait of San Quentin at night. So many prisons are illuminated 24 hours of 20 every day. And even though they're located in really rural areas because they give off so much light pollution, there are constant physical reminders in the sky that they're there. So this is a portrait of San Quentin at night when the light gives off the evidence of, of where it is and also speaks to the fact that like, these are people who are like constantly being seen. Um, on this side, we have this incredibly beautiful video by Kepwani Kawanga, and I really en encourage you to come back and spend more time with it. Um, it's a moving camera shot across four different painted colored walls. Those walls are painted Baker, Baker Miller pink which is a color pink developed by the military because it was thought to soothe aggression in prison inmates. So a uh, color being used as a kind of psychological control. And it's paired with this pure ripple in white, which is a color that the modernist artist and architect Le Corbusier thought was the ideal color for viewing art. And then lastly, this um, buff and spinach green was, color, was two colors devised by a hospital surgeon in the early 20th century to, because he thought that they were the best colors to, um, for a surgeon to perform surgery in because the green would like offset the red that's found like in an open body. And, um, so Kapwani is putting these four colors together because all of these color theories are being thought of at the same time. And they all come back to what is the best way to view somebody, include the viewing, like including an incarcerated subject. Behind me, and this is strategically placed here, this is a um, scale replica of a jail wall that takes up 16 acres in Chicago's Little Village neighborhood. This is an artwork by Maria Gaspar. And I think what's really important to the piece is that while the jail wall is a fixed structure, the way that Maria has built it as um, transparent and also um, movable becomes a way of, to function as a metaphor for how may, we may think about dismantling structures like this wall. But within the exhibition, it also separates and puts behind a wall these other artworks here. So Martin Wong is a really important artist who's, un who's now passed, who in the late 1980s or early 1990s was painting what was in his immediate proximity in New York and the Bronx neighborhood, including this prison. But having been friends with a number of artists who also had criminal records. He would also engage with and collaborate with these artists on plays about incarceration. And he offers these incredibly tender portraits, like this one, um, where this man is rendered like incredibly delicate and vulnerable, almost like a lullaby within this prison cell. Or this painting, for instance, where you don't know which side of the wall you're standing on. Are you the guard or are you the incarcerated person? I think that's also something that's important to Maria's wall here, that because of its transparency and that you can occupy it and move it on both sides, you're not sure which side you're standing on as well. 
So if we move down here, My friend from Tulane, this is um, Shander McCormick and Keith Calhoun. So Shander and Keith are based in New Orleans, and for the past 40 years, one of the sites that they have frequently photographed is Angola State Penitentiary in Louisiana. Angola State Penitentiary is actually Louisiana State Penitentiary, and it's called Angola because it was built on a plantation that was called Angola. And it was called Angola because the majority of slaves there were from the country Angola. And so it carries that name with it into the present, which is really not ironic, considering that the majority of the prisoners there spend their days tending to the fields and growing crops, which are then sold by the prison industry to your local food stores. Um, squash is the number one vegetable produced in prisons, and probably the majority of the squash that we eat has been prison produced. Zach Blass is an artist who is interested in like more contemporary or digital phenomenon and capture. Um, and so what he's done to make this project was um, registered his own face, this is him, and three other artists. They submitted their faces to a biometric facial scan just like the ones we may have to go through at airports or while we're being into, entered into a system, that biometric scan translates your face into a series of points. Um, he then translated that two-dimensional drawing into a three-dimensional sculpture and then made them into wearable performance artists or performance objects. So what you see here is each of the four people wearing the sculptural version of their biometric scan. Um, what also became apparent to him was how these biometric scan had a formal relationship to previous histories of like kind of incarceration devices. So in the 19th century there was a sort of like a face cage that somebody people could wear that would allow them to still be productive members of society while also more like the Scarlet Letter, like bring about like public humiliation. So there was this um, sort of devices that functioned as like historical ankle bracelet bracelets, and so it's these like past histories and these future histories of like what could happen with biometric scanning as capture devices that Zach Blass is interested in. So we've come to the last section of the exhibition, um, and that has a question about how one, we've gone through like how the process by one enters the prison system, and now we've come to the section where we think about how one exits the prison system. I'm gonna pause here to talk briefly about the work of James Drake, who I believe is here too. Um, James was at the time based in El Paso and working with the partners of the men who were incarcerated at the El Paso City Jail and also the women on the outside. He had learned through a, a very famous poet, Jimmy Baca, that there's actually a, a sign language that's practiced in prisons across the way. And what he had figured out was that the men were signaling to their girlfriends outside by signing on the shadows in the street. And so here is the sign in the sign language that means freedom. And we also have um, the page open to this page in this artist book here. It's a multi-dimensional project that includes video, drawing, and an artist book. And so here we have the sign for freedom written in the man, like the hands of an incarcerated man at the El Paso City Jail. And within the book itself, it's open to a page that could potentially be his girlfriend in this way that they're like communicating through the wall. Um, this is another sort of private moment that has a parallel to the arrest moment across the way. This is the moment in which artists who are thinking about the death penalty as a phenomenon are working. And there's four projects that are um, here. I'll let y'all trickle in and I'll meet you on the other side. So in Texas, we're pretty well known for our death penalty. And for a while there was an online platform archive in which you could read the words of every man death, killed on death row and read uh, a list of what they had ordered as part of their final meal. 
that practice of having a special final meal requested actually ended with the execution of one of the men who killed James Byrd. Um, that man had a long history of being associated with white supremacists, and upon his execution, he really, he like ordered an extravagant meal that he then like also didn't eat. So because of the severity of the crime and the way that he sort of abused this like last rights privilege, Texas made a decision to not give anybody a final meal. But artists have um, really long been interested in the online database that has the collection of all of this information about the men that have been executed in the state. So Richard Kamler, whose work you'll see when you turn the corner, it's two lead plates, recreates two of those meals that have been rec um, requested by men on death row in lead, which is a, kind of a material of in, like emotive significance here. On the video behind you is a project by Lucky Pierre. For the last 10 years, they have been staging collaborative public performances in which they recreate a final meal for each of, for one um, volunteer who then eats the meal in silence while being photographed. I had the opportunity to eat a final meal and I actually had made a decision that I was not gonna eat the final meal, so I just chose instead to like sit and have a visual with it. But they, there are 310 meals that have been recorded on this online database, and over the past 10 years, I believe that Lucky Pierre has recreated 275. Um, so you can see that on the back wall. Here, on this uh, series of framed works, is a project by Louis Camdenser in which he culled that same archive that has the written statements of men, their last words, as recorded to a stenographer at the moment of death. And Louise Kamnitzer culled through the entire archive and excerpted out words um, that were expressions of love, mostly to family members and wanting to shift the term um, of that kind of final moment to one of love. And then behind you is an artist named Mark Menjivar, he's actually based in San Antonio, Texas, and he works with the Texas After Violence Project. Um, through working with this organization, he was, he became the custodian of an archive of a man named David Lee Powell. Powell was, lived on death row for 32 years, which is the longest, uh, 32, years. 32 years, which I think is, he's the long, he's, lived on death row longer than anybody else in the country. Um, so the photograph on the bottom is a collection of his own personal archive when they cleaned out his cell after his death. And then the text above is the catalog of all of the items that he lived with um, until that moment. Um, behind you on, this, on the right side of the wall is the work of an artist named Gregory Sale who works with the organization in, in an organization in Los Angeles called the Anti-Recidivism Coalition. And together through this project, Gregory has worked in collaboration with a number of incarcerated people, and he realized that the identification card was this kind of tool that was both inside the system and out. It was really also interesting to Gregory because talking with him, I also realized it's not that one re-enter, like leaves the prison and is just like in a space of freedom. We're just moving from one system that is walled and has a set of rules into another system that is also has a set of rules but perhaps is not walled. And I think that that kind of channeling from one system to another is, is um, laced with different traps for formerly incarcerated people. So for Gregory, the, the identification card was something that moved with them from one space to the other and was a place where he wanted to help to kind of set up a scenario for them to envision themselves in a different place than being formerly, than being an incarcerated person and was a space of like possibility for the future. So each one of these cards has been designed by a formerly incarcerated person as a way to think about where they want to go once released. Tony, did you want to talk about your work? And I wound up uh, walking into a police sting operation. I brought an envelope with four ounces of cocaine. And I, uh, I did everything I could do wrong. And I wound up 
with two 15 to life sentences. Never arrested before, first time nonviolent drug offense. This shows the insanity of the war on drugs that exists. And today, uh, Jeff Sessions wants to bring back those failed drug <laughs> policies that were uh, done away with almost by Obama and his administration. This piece here is my famous self-portrait, 15 to life. It was exhibited at the Whitney Museum of American Art while I was in prison. One night I was sitting in my cell in 1988 after three years of serving time, picked up a mirror, I looked in the mirror and I saw an individual who's gonna spend the most productive years of his life in a cage, picked up a canvas, I painted that self-portrait. Seven and a half years later, I wound up at the Whitney and I got a lot of publicity on my case and I literally painted my way to freedom when the governor of New York granted me executive clemency. Thank you. So now today, I'm an activist. I work with the Drug Policy Alliance, leading advocacy organization in the United States. I incorporate my art with my activism so people can understand the, the, the reality of, of, of being in prison. Thank you very much. Thank you. The last two artists that I'm going to talk about are here. So um, we've laid out three kinds of ways of exiting the prison system. The death penalty, meaning that you die in prison, reentry in society here. And then lastly, um, I wanted to save space for the people who are like those that tiered to even, who's a Chicago-based artist, collaborates with our youth that were tried as an adult and sentenced to life while in prison. This is a phenomenon called natural life. And in her video, Tirza um, worked with five youth who are now adults who have grown up in prison to restage their stories. But because they can't leave the prison, um, she worked with them using virtual reality and also to script their stories to be reenacted by teenagers um, using this, actually this abandoned prison that is now rented out as a movie set in Michigan. And then on this wall is a really important video. It's a collaboration by two artists named Sarah Ross and Damon Locks. Sarah and Damon are important members of an organization called Prisons and Neighborhoods Project, which connects Statesville, men incarcerated at Statesville Prison. They teach courses there. Um, and then the products of those courses, whether it be art or writing, then gets represented in the Chicago. And it's this really important way that these families are brought together, even through incarceration. So Statesville Prison also has a very high number of men who are incarcerated to, or sentenced to long-term sentences. So in 1994, with the Truth in Sentencing Laws, um, that meant that... Um, People who are incarcerated are now required to serve out the majority of their sentences, 80%, without thinking about being paroled, which means that people are in prison longer than they ever have before. And this also means that if you are incarcerated when you're older, that you will likely become elderly in prison. So what I think is really amazing about the long term is that when Sarah and Damon proposed it to the men that they were collaborating with, they really felt it was important that the best artists that are on at Statesville contributed to this project. And together they created this really important animation that tells the story of truth and sentencing laws, how they came to pass, the effects of the elderly on uh, incarcerating the elderly as both like personal and economic issues and it's a video that they intend to be able to use as an advocacy tool and I think that that's something that's really important to all of the artists that are working in this exhibition something that I wanted to highlight too it's not only just about representing the sort of problem but these are all artists who are actively engaging in communities who are working with incarcerated people who are actively trying to make change so I'm going to end there and if you have any questions, I'll be here and I'd love to talk to you.